see. Uh, first off, would you mind describing for us uh, uh, where you were born and uh, what what the neighborhood was that you lived in? Okay, uh, I was I was born December second, nineteen thirteen, on Pond Avenue in Newport. In Newport. Okay. Where were your parents born? My mother was born in Portsmouth, Virginia, and my father was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Okay. Do you know Do you know when they came to uh, Newport? No, that I I don't I don't. Know. What was your dad's occupation? My father was more or less the laborer. And he worked at Melville for years, and then he worked for the city, and that was labor and work. He used to lay curbing for the city. When you say Melville, are you referring to uh, out here in Portsmouth? Portsmouth, right. Okay. What did he do out there? Also uh, construction there? He, he did labor and work there. Did he ever change jobs, or he stayed within the construction business? He never changed jobs. He did it all his life. And your mom's occupation, was she... My mother used to take in laundry work for years, up until she died. Mm -hmm. she, she did laundry work for various people in the city. Uh, not just in the neighborhood, but throughout no, the city? No, around the city. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. People would bring her their laundry? Well, no, when, when we were young, my brother and I used to go and pick up the laundry at the different people's houses. And then we'd bring it home, and then when the laundry was fin finished, then my sister and I, or my brother, would take it back to the people. So your mother mostly worked inside the house. Inside the house, yes. Sir. Yeah. She had a lot of laundry to do, did she? Oh, a lot of laundry to do. Were you all helping out with her at that time? No. Of course, in them days, they didn't have dryers and things like they have now. She used to wash the clothes and then put them out on a line and wait till they dried. And then she brought them in and did the ironing. And she, she didn't have an electric flat. She had the regular... Iron that was heated on the coal stove. Mm. She, she never used electric iron in her life. Mm -hmm. You know the old type uh -huh. iron that they use, the cast iron. That's what she did the iron with. Mm. Yeah, was, she did have a washing machine. She didn't have a washing machine. She used to wash the clothes in these big tubs mm. and the washboard. Just to scrub mm -hmm. with the washboard. You know, she didn't have a washing machine. How many brothers or sisters did you have? Four boys, four brothers, and four sisters. Huh? Three brothers. You only had three brothers. Leroy. Harold and Johnny. Harold and Johnny. You had three brothers. Oh, okay. Myself was in the four. I was thinking of myself. A total of eight children. Eight children. Right. Where were you? Were you the uh, oldest or youngest? No, I had an older brother. He's deceased, and then I'm next to, to the oldest. What kind of things did your family enjoy doing together at that time as you were growing up? Well, in them days, there really wasn't anything much to do except go to church, because in them days we didn't have a radio, not until later years, so there really wasn't much to do. In, in Newport in them days. Mm -hmm. When did you get a radio, do you recall, about when? <clears throat> I think our, our first radio was in the, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. What year, I don't know, but I know it was in the 40s, it was late. We got our first radio, my brother was bought it. And he was working out of Boston, and he bought us a radio on Christmas. Can I answer that? Yes, sir. You were married when your brother was in the We were married? No. 
Oh, gosh. Is that on <laughs> That's okay. It doesn't have to be ter- too terribly accurate. Just kind of a rough estimate. Well, we'll say in the 20s then. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> when you were growing up, where did you play? What did I play? Uh-huh. We played on Pond Avenue. We used to play in a lot on Pond Avenue. An empty lot. An, an empty lot. Mm-hmm. And then when we were younger, well, in the, those days, we went to a place called the community center where we used to play basketball. Mm. That is off of Marble Street. Oh, yes. Right. And that large one is still there. It used to be the old Quaker right. uh, that's meeting was, house. Right. That's mm-hmm. where we used to play basketball. Who did you play with? You had special friends? Well, we played amongst ourselves with, the, with the, what we call the gang growing up. Mm-hmm. And there was around about seven of us, I think, that we played together. Besides your parents, uh, sisters, and besides your brothers, did you have any other family living in Newport at that time? No. no. Most of them, I guess, were down in Virginia. Well, the uh, some still in Virginia. My mother has, uh, I believe, two sisters now living in, in Virginia, it's in Hampton, Virginia. What? She should be there too. So I know Your mother's brother was a singer. My mother's brother was a singer. He sang with the Hampton Quartet for 50 years. Awesome. And they traveled all over the world. And then the last concert he sang was at St. George's School and they gave him a purse and then he retired and then they built a bust of him, a bronze bust in Hampton. That was at the Hampton Institute. Uh, did your mother have any interests or activities outside the home? It sounds like she was very busy. At no, she didn't. She just, we had, she had so many children that she just worked all her life. Yeah. Did the children help her out a lot around the house? When y'all oh, yes, home? they did. My sisters were great for helping her around the house. What about your father? Did he have any interests or activities outside of the home? No, or just, well, my father always had a garden, mm-hmm. which kept him active in the summertime. Mm-hmm. But was, like I say, outside of that, uh, he, well, I, I missed the one thing. Uh, years ago, my father drove a, a carriage, horse and buggy, for, you know, for years. As a trade, you mean a lot of He worked for a, a man whose name was Lawton, and he had carriages like they have taxis now. Uh-huh. And that's what he did. He used to drive around, go around the drive and take people on tours and things like I that. See. Here in Newport? Here in Newport, yes. Uh-huh. He did that while you were growing up? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get to go with him on some of the rides? No, I, I rode a couple of times uh-huh. with him. Because he used to bring the horse and buggy in at the house, the carriage, and he'd give us a ride once in a while. But I think that they just couldn't do that too much in those days. Did your parents uh, discuss uh, their future or the family's future much with you in growing up? Or, you know, okay. Didn't talk too much about coming events or what was going to happen next. No, they were just interested in. All of us getting an education. 
Mm, they did mention they thought it was important yeah. to get education. Thinking of education, now where did you go to school? I went to Cranston and Calvert School, which is off of Broadway. Uh -huh. I only went, I didn't go to high school, I just went to grade school because I left school when I was, say, 16 years old, and that's when I started working because there were so many in the family that it was pretty hard on my mother and father, so I just decided to leave school and, and go to work. So that's when I started working when I was 16 years old. Oh, I see. <clears throat> Did you find your school experiences uh, valuable for you? Not until I got out. <laughs> and then I realized that mm -hmm. that's what I needed was an education. I think I was the only one that got out of school at that early age because my sisters did get to high school and my mm -hmm. brother, but I was the only one that didn't get to high school. Hmm. Your sister was a yeah. teacher? My sister was a, a teacher oh. in, in high school. And then I had another sister that she just well, she retired, and she was at the Library of Congress. She left Newport, yeah. and she took her civil service exam, and so she went to Washington. She stayed there hmm. up until uh, well, just last week when she died and went to the funeral. And her daughter works in the Library of Congress. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, after you finished, uh, what was it, after you dropped out of uh, school at, at 16, did you get any training beyond that in, in uh, job skills training? Or well, I went to work for a man who had a delicatessen store, and I worked there for about a year. And then I, you want me to give you the rest mm -hmm. of it? Okay. This was when you were about 16 or 17, you started yes, working at right. the Gulf of Okay, in 1929, I was working for Mr. D.B. Allen, who had a delicatessen store on Broadway. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned some of my cooking, besides getting the experience from my, oh. my mother uh -huh. and another lady that taught, taught me a lot about cooking. And then in 19, uh, the latter part of 1929, I left the delicatessen store because there wasn't too much business, so I was unemployed until 1930. In 1930, I was doing odd jobs around, like washing cars, uh, going in people's houses, uh, doing cleaning and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then, Around 1932, I worked three months as a packer for the Manuel Brothers. They used to pack the furniture and china and all for the Navy people. And used to, I worked for them. And then I got laid off there. And then 1933 to 19, 1932 to 1933. I was working parties also and going around cooking for the Navy people around at that time. Mm -hmm. and then that's, that's all that, that there. But then, then in uh, November 1933 to 1934, that was eight, I worked eight months. I was working for the New England Steamship Company. Mm -hmm. And then I got laid off, the well, they, they shut down there for a while, and then I worked, in 1934, I went to work at the Casino Theater, and that was a summer job, so that, that was up till September. And then 1936, I was a laborer for the SURA, which was a project that, I think, President Roosevelt had for the people who are out of work. Yeah. 
So then after the, the, the casino, which was a summer job, I went to work also for a while. I went to work for the WPA. I worked on the WPA from 1937. In 1937, I was a laborer there. But then I went back to the steam company to work. And then they laid down, that's when they shut down. And that was the end of the, the Marine Steamship Company. So in 35, I got, I got married and I worked in a private family. I was a houseman, like a butler. Mm -hmm. I worked for Mr. Mr. Dirk Friedman, who was an artist, who was the man that did all the painting and the artwork at the Siemens Institute. Mm -hmm. He was killed in an automobile accident. I worked for him about four months and he was killed in an automobile accident. So then I took care of the estate for the bank. The bank kept me on until they had an auction and then all the furniture and everything was sold. So then a man named uh, Mr. and Mrs. Edward F. Burns, they bought the house that I was working in and I, I went to work for them. Then I stayed there, or I was there during the 38 hurricane. And I stayed there for well, four years. So then the war came, and I had to get out because the government said find essential work within 30 days and notify them. So then I went to work at Pool Island, where the torpedoes and all. Mm -hmm. I worked there until I was laid off. Again, because I was a war service appointee, I worked over the blue line for two and a half years. And then I was right back to doing regular work around because I had to have something to do, so I used to go around house cleaning. And I did that for a while, and then I went to work at Quonset. They were hiring at Quonset. So I worked over there, and if you stayed a year, you pass, then you were hired regular. But after 11 months, they laid off four or five hundred people. So I was out of a job then I, again. So let me see. I lost them. Is this, is this all? Um, so after I left Quonset Point, I was going around doing housework. And I did that for a while, and then I went to the valet cleaners, and I was in charge of the laundry there, and I used to fire a boiler, and I stayed there for maybe two years, and then after, in 1951, I left the valet and I went to work for the school department. And I stayed at the school department. I put 27 years. I worked 15 years at Rogers High School. And then I transferred to grade school. And then I stayed in the school system up until, what, 60? I When did she look at me? So then I, I stayed in the school system until 1965, and then I retired. Well, that's right. Well, that's right. Then you went to the grade school. Then you went where? Then you went to the grade school. Actually, that's right. Then you went to the grade school. Yes, that's what I said. But you didn't retire. You went to the grade school. I worked in the grade school. I worked in the grade school, the grade school. The grade school. The grade school for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And then in, then in 65. You were in 65 and retired. And you were doing no, janitorial work? Can you understand? He left the grade school at the high school in uh -huh. 65. And then he went to work in the grade school for 20. I think it was 78. Anyway, he retired uh, 70 years ago. 76 years ago. Okay, and you were working principally as a janitor? Yes, I did. Okay. Now at Rogers, when I worked at Rogers, I was a custodian, what well, they call it, a janitor and custodian of athletic equipment. Mm -hmm. So I was in charge of all the equipment. Mm -hmm. 
I started the Rogers High School for 15 years. You also had a catering business? I well then, yes, I started doing catering just like on the side. As a matter of fact, all the time that I worked, most of the years that I worked for school, I did that on the time, on my spare time. I wasn't working steady at it because I was working for the school. Mm -hmm. So then after I started, to, my catering started to pick up and I started to get a good name in the catering. So then when I left the school, I was still doing the catering. I think you said one time uh, your, one of your first catering jobs was a uh, pretty large one. You had a couple of shifts. One of the biggest jobs that I had in the catering was I did a party for the Yellowstone. That was, was it, so I think that was a supply ship. And then I used to do various parties for the Navy. I used to go around and ten bar for the Army, Navy, yeah. and the Marine officers. I did that for years. I did that. So that was kind of like uh, weekend work, I guess. Mostly that's... weekends, yes. Mostly Saturdays. That's why I could do it because during the school time you couldn't. Because you, you know, once in a while I used to get a job during the school time, but like it was at after four thirty or something like that. But mostly all our parties was on a Saturday, and a few were on Sundays. About your neighborhood, uh, Mr. Tippett, in growing up in your neighborhood, uh, did you and the neighbors, uh, was there a lot of talking going on, or a lot of uh, uh, socializing with the neighbors? Or? I think that the street that I lived on was some of the nicest people that you'd ever want to come in contact with. Mm -hmm. Everybody on that street got along, and we never had any problems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Because if there was any problems, then the people used to go see your parents. And that was taken care of. Once they went to see your father, well, you just didn't do anything wrong anymore. Mm -hmm. My father was a very strict man, and he never hit us with a strap. He had a hand of steel, and when he hit you with that hand, you know it. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I, up until I was 16, I still this is when I started working, but up when I was 15, I still had to be in the house by 9 o'clock. And if you were in the house by 9 o'clock, my father would lock the door. Hmm. And I can remember one time I stayed out because the guys were kidding me. So I stayed out a little, oh, maybe after four, after 9. So when I went home, the front door was locked. So I got in the window. And when I got in the window, my father was waiting for me to put the light on. So after that, nine o'clock, there was no problem. That's it. <laughs> but I, I, we had, I had good parents, and they, they, they were very strict, but they were good parents. They were hardworking people. My mother and my father both mm -hmm. worked hard to, to, to put food on the table. And a lot of the neighborhood uh, parents seemed to be that way too. They were very good people. Mm -hmm. Very good people. Did you notice any particular holidays were celebrated in your neighborhood in a big way? Fourth of July, I mm. think, was the biggest. Yeah. It was just, them days, the fireworks weren't as, as expensive as they are today, mm. and most everybody used to have fireworks, and when ours were going, we used to go up and watch the others shoot off the fireworks. Mm -hmm. But Fourth of July, I would say, was a very important day. In my, in my, when I was coming up. As a matter of fact, when my younger days, I, I worked on the ice team. And they, I worked for some weeks on a, on an ice team where there was a horse and wagon. Uh, just carrying uh, blocks of ice. Blocks ice, of ice. ice boxes. Right. Nice. And then there was the, like the American Ice Company, and there was a Wheeler Ice Company, but the Wheeler Ice Company, they had the natural ice. They used to cut the ice from the pond oh. and store it over, over on Bridge Street. Hmm. And I worked 
for example, in other words, if I was working for your company, you couldn't use me today, then I'd go to the other ice company. Mm -hmm. And they used to give me a job. And of course, I used to get all the third floors. <laughs> oh, Lots of times I complained, I said to what, the driver one day, I said, how come I get all the third floors? He said, well, you're the third man, so that's the reason <laughs> why you get all the third floors. But that actually was something to do with a job. Mm -hmm. and because like I say, in 1935, I, we got married. And things were tough. Those, those yeah. were hard days in 35. Mm -hmm. A lot of people weren't working. But Pardon? Well, that's what I said. Uh -huh. I worked on the ice. Call how much you were, do you recall how much you were paid? On the ice team? Uh -huh. Yeah, I got a dollar a day, mm -hmm. which wasn't much money. But if you were, like, you used to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And for once in a while, they'd give you an extra dollar. But it wasn't too much money because they didn't make too much money themselves. Mm -hmm. The fellows that ran, drove the trucks. They didn't make much money, but it was just some, something. A dollar went a long ways then, anyhow. Mm -hmm. Do you recall if there was a particular person in your neighborhood uh, that played a particularly important role, kind of like a uh, person who many people in, in the neighborhood went to for advice or anything? No, not that. I, mm -hmm. Uh, how did you, would you take time to tell me a little bit about uh, meeting Grace? How that happened? Well, I used to go around with three or four fellas, and we used to call it up on the hill. And we used to, well, we met really at the church. Grace wasn't living in your neighborhood. No, she used to come from Washington for the summer, just for the summer, and then she'd go back in, in the wintertime. But then she came back to Newport. Thirty-three. She came back to Newport in thirty-three and went to Rogers High School. Hmm. And that's when we started going steady. So. Rogers High School at that time, was that on Broadway? It was on Broadway, yes. yes. Excuse me. And that's where you met at that time, was it? I met her in my, well, in my younger days, I, I met I met her. She used to come up just for the summer. And she was in high school when you met her? Yeah. You were. Right. She was in high school. Did you meet through some mutual friends or something? Just by going up with the fellas where the where the girls were, mm -hmm. and that's how we we met. Yeah. When y'all got married, where did you first live? We lived on Deploy Street. And we were living in a furnished house at that, at that time. Mm. And I think y'all said you were married in '35. Nineteen thirty-five. I think you said, uh, Mr. Tripp, that y'all have uh, six children, is that right? Six children? Yes, you Four boys and two girls. Four boys and two girls. Sir? They were all born here in Newport? They were all born in Newport. They were all born in Newport. Were they born at home or in the hospital? No, they were all born in the hospital. All my children were born in the hospital. I was the only one that was born at home in the day. Both of y'all were born at home. Uh, what sort of uh, things would uh, you and Grace uh, discipline the children about? Well, my wife really did the discipline. She did most of the discipline. She held the iron hand. I just used to watch and listen. Uh -huh. And what sort of things would uh, would uh, Grace discipline the children about? 
well, mostly school and the behavior, although we never had any problems with our children. Uh, it, when my children were, say, around about 12 years old, when we lived on Kingston Avenue, we had a large yard. We used to play basketball out in the yard, we played horseshoes. We had a spotlight up at night where we used to play basketball, sometimes maybe 9, 9 o'clock at night, so the neighbors complained and then we would stop. But then we also, my, my youngsters were interested in track, and all my boys were on the track team at Rogers. All four boys were on the track team. And one of them held the 880 record for about five years before it was broken. They both, both of the boys, two of the boys played on Rogers High School basketball team. And they were, when they were seniors, they were still, you know, they graduated from Rogers, they were on the basketball team. And then two of them were in the ROTC mm -hmm. at Rogers High School. One of them made company commander, and what was the one lieutenant, one lieutenant, one major. Was lieutenant, one was major. Uh, were your children free to play uh, at the time with anyone that they pleased? Oh yeah, they were free to play. Except when they were younger, they weren't allowed out in the yard. Uh, they didn't dare to open that gate until they got to the age where they. She knew that they would be all right going out in the street, but she never allowed them out of the yard. That's why she was had a strong arm on them. Yes. They didn't run. We knew where our children were. We didn't have to go around and look for them. Because when they got out of school, if they weren't home at a certain time, I was working, and she'd go look for them. And if they were, sometimes they were at the school maybe just racing the board for the teacher or something of that sort. But they always, my children always came home from school. And were they raised mostly in this house, or were you, you weren't in this house at that time? No. The only one who really was raised in this house was David. That But you have apparently lived in this neighborhood pretty much all of your life, uh, on about three different streets or so. This is the longest that I've lived. In this neighborhood here? Right. When did you all move into this house? Early 60s. Okay. Uh, how did you happen to choose this particular neighborhood? My wife went looking for a house. She's been looking for a house for a long time, but I didn't want to move where I was at because I liked it on that street. And every time she would say, well, she had a house, I'd say, well, we, we don't have a down payment. And we can't get a house until we have a down payment. So finally, uh, that didn't work. So I came home one night and my wife said, after you have your supper, I'd like to take you someplace. And so she took me over here and she said, I've taken care of everything. The, the paper, do you, do you like the house? And I said, oh yeah, I like it. She said, well, good. She said, because I made arrangements to buy it mm -hmm. and we got it through the People's Credit Union. And that's how we got this house. Mm. But if it was left to me, I probably would have still been living on King Sinatra because I, I just didn't want to move up that street because I liked it. Mm -hmm. But this was a real nice, because we, over here we had, on King Sinatra we used to heat with oil. The oil stoves, they used to have a coal stove. 
But then it was nice coming over here because I had a furnace and I didn't have to worry about ashes or anything of that yeah. sort. Yeah. But the reason why I got this house is because she made the move, which I wouldn't make. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how this neighborhood looked when you first uh, moved here? Uh, any, have there any, been any major changes that have taken place since you moved here in this neighborhood? No, they haven't. It's just that people have moved, people have died, and different ones have moved in. Mm -hmm. When we first moved around here, there weren't too many people that knew us except the lady across, across the street. And we had did her 50th anniversary for her, and it was, it was quite a surprise when we moved over here. We had catered for her 50th anniversary, but on the, on the whole, people of her, we got along with the people. We still get along with the people here. Uh, the neighborhood that you moved from, which was kind of the same neighborhood as this, but it's on another end or extreme of it, uh, had you seen that part of the neighborhood change? Oh, I have seen that. It's unbelievable how. That neighborhood has changed. As a matter of fact, that uh, I was interested in buying the house that I was living in, but then my wife didn't like it. She just wanted to get a get a house of her own, and she didn't. I guess she didn't like that house too much that we were living. It was a nice house, but as I said, we had coal there and we had oil stoves. How had you seen that part of the neighborhood change? How have I seen? Yeah. yeah. What what changes have occurred over there? Well, all the houses. Mostly have been made over, and, and uh, it's what it's really what it, it's quite a change. You walk through there now, and you, you you can't believe the change that they've made. Whereas this neighborhood has kind of stayed the same. This, it, this was neighbor, this neighbor, it was always in good shape. Yes, yeah, right. Good this neighborhood has changed, yes. but the houses over there where we used to live now some of them sell for sixty thousand dollars and forty thousand dollars, which is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Can you describe, uh, well, you've mentioned some things that you like about uh, your house, the, the, uh, the, the heating is a little more efficient and easier to use. Uh, can you describe some other things that you like about this house, this neighborhood? Well, one thing, as I said, I don't have to put out ashes and things like that. And this this house here is no problem because I have oil oil heat where before I used to have oil stove and because you're always worried about them because lots of times they were dangerous although we never had any problem because if you take care of them and clean them you never had any problem we never had any fire. These were kerosene type. Well, they were kerosene type of stove. We had two plus a coal stove. And then before we moved, we had a gas heater put in. But then we left, when we left, we just we sold it. And so when we moved, we came here. We didn't have to worry about anything like that. The neighborhood that you grew up in, uh, up until the time you got married, uh, did most people own their houses? Most of the people in, on Kingston Avenue own their houses. And what's that on? On oh, Avenue. Pine Avenue. You grew up on Pine Avenue. I grew up, yes, I grew up on Pine Avenue. Most of the people on Pine Avenue own their own houses. Mm -hmm. my, my parents, they didn't own their house. But most of the people, they own their own houses. Did most of the people in, in your neighborhood at that time on Pond Avenue, did most of them belong to uh, any one particular ethnic group? Or? Most of the people that lived on Pine Avenue when I was coming up, Mostly the Catholics, the Irish people. Mm -hmm. Were they of a particular race? Uh, mostly Irish, you say? Mostly Irish in Pine yeah. Avenue at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, because some people were tied in with the church all their lives also. Uh, did, did your family get along pretty well with the. Uh, well, we, we, we got along very well. Mm -hmm. My father and my mother in law got along very well. See, they were good people in them days. They were friendly. If you needed any help, they would give you a hand. I, I can remember when a neighbor, and he was he was in the Navy, I think he was a chief, 
and his father and I, my father, were very friendly. And he said to my father one day, he called my father Trip. He said, I'm putting in an oil burner. He said, I have five ton of coal that I'll give you. You can get it out of the cellar. And so my father came home and he said he had five ton of coal that was, had been given to him. And of course, I was wondering how he was going to get it out of the cellar. Well, the re way we got it out of the cellar, we took potato bags. <coughs> and we filled the potato bags with the coal. And then we put it on a wagon, and I brought it home, and we dumped it through the window. Now the kids that we, I played with in the neighborhood, they gave me a hand. And then, any, then also, sometimes a neighbor would have wood, and they would have a truck, and they dumped the wood in front of the house. And then when I came home from school, I saw that wood out there. I knew that wood had to get in the yard before my mom, my father came home, because I used to like to go and play basketball. But you couldn't go play basketball if that wood was out there in the street. So the kids wanted me to play with them, so they gave me a hand to put the wood in the, in the yard. Hmm. And lots of times, they all used to give us a hand in cutting up the wood. That's the way the kids were. Huh. Okay. Do you remember in growing up in that neighborhood, uh, if y'all did uh, shopping, did you do a lot of shopping in the neighborhood, or did you shop well, in the stores outside? There was a store on the corner of Pond Avenue where, where we did some shopping, and then there was a store on the corner of Equality Park and West Broadway that was a finest, they called finest, the name of the finest store, like the First National, and that's where we did of shopping at groceries, but on the corner store, there was, they sold meat and, and poultry. And that's where we used to buy our meats and poultry. Mm -hmm. The store there was very handy. Were there any uh, voluntary uh, neighborhood organizations that, that you all were in or that you joined any clubs? Or? Not like they have today. You know, people just mostly worked and, and stayed in the house. The elderly people mm -hmm. just stayed in the house. At that time, were most of the people who lived in the neighborhood families, or were they single people? Mostly families. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mostly with children. Right. Usually quite a few and A lot of children. Uh -huh. Did most of the people in the neighborhood seem to earn about the same amount of money? Well, I, in my father, they made more money than my father because some of them had pretty good jobs where they worked. I, I, some of the members, some of the neighbors on Pond Avenue also worked for the steamship company for years. And then they worked in a mill, some of them worked in a mill. Now there was, there was a mill on Pond Avenue where some worked. There. But then some of them worked out in private families. There was a textile mill on Pond Avenue? No, it was a, a sawmill. Oh, I see. A sawmill. Oh. <clears throat> Most of your friends, then, from what you said, <clears throat> lived right in that right neighborhood. Right in that neighborhood. Okay. See, when I was coming up, on one side of the street on Pond Avenue, it was like they called them the block area. Since then, if you've been through Pond Avenue, it's all new housing projects. But in them days, people lived in the blocks, and they didn't have any electricity. They had oil lamps and things like that. But they were all, all good people in those houses. What did you like most about your neighborhood, as you remember, growing up there? Well, the friendliness of the people. Mm -hmm. Because what I like, one thing about the neighborhood, the people, some of the neighbors had good pear trees and, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, one one of the houses, they had, the, I think, the best peaches in, in, in the city. I can remember there was a, 
captain of the police department, and he, he lived on Pine Avenue, three houses from my house, and he had the best grapes that you'd ever want to see. And no one would ever go in and touch his grapes, so one night we decided that we're going to get up enough nerve to go get some of his grapes. So we saw him go to work, and he had quite a few boys too, but they were young. So we went in, and we got some grapes, so the fellas said, we got enough, so let's go. So I said, okay, so I said, I'm going to get a few more, and I had a paper bag. So all of a sudden, a hand came down on my shoulder, and it was the captain of the police department. And this was about 10 minutes to 9. So I said, I suppose you're going to take me down to the police station. He said, no, I'm not going to take you down to the police station. I'm going to take you to your father. Because my father had gone to bed. And he woke my father up. And he told him. And that was the end of that. There was no, no problem anymore. But he didn't hold it against us. He just had the best grapes and everybody was a scared. And he used to let him stay on the tree and rot. He never even picked them. Mm -hmm. So we went in and we thought we would try it for once. <laughs> there he was. Yeah, but then he didn't go to work that night. He just probably was going to take a walk. Mm -hmm. And he, he caught us. But we never really got into any trouble. Mm -hmm. Because the policemen in them days knew you. And they knew your family. And they knew that your father was strict on you. So if you got out of hand, they just go down and see your father. Mm -hmm. He didn't take it out of the police station. Mm -hmm. I was never taken to the police station. None of the kids were. And after a certain while, we used to hang out, sit on the doorsteps and tell stories. I used to play horseshoes. And at, at, at night, when, when it got near 9 o'clock, we all just disappeared. Now, if we were out there, sometimes in the summer, and the policeman would say, okay, I'm coming back in 15 minutes, and I want to see this gang broken up. And it was broken up. Yet they weren't causing any trouble, but they just didn't want to see a gang congregated. Mm -hmm. But they never had any problems with the kids. What did you like least about your neighborhood at that time, if you can remember? What did I like least about it? Mm -hmm. well, I couldn't really say. Okay. It, just, you had a lot of good memories about oh, it. Yeah. Not that many that you didn't enjoy. Okay. Uh, organizations in your neighborhood, uh, you said that there weren't any that you recall it, or not as many yet, you know, as there are now. There no, were some organizations that were popular at that time, clubs, or that some people were involved in? No, not that I recall. I'm just, you know. I guess your family was mostly involved, perhaps, in church in organizations, church. religious that's, organizations. That's the organization that where we spent our time. Yeah. You were in the Boy Scouts? Oh, yes, sir. Oh. How old were you when you joined the Boy Scouts? When I joined the Boy Scouts, I was 13, but the fellows that I hung around with were 12 years old. Yeah. And I can remember the, the night when we went to a church where we were going to organize. <coughs> And the commissioner, he was from Providence, and he said, now, I want to make sure that you fellas are going to stick. I don't want you to join and take up our time if you're not going to stay in the organization. And I, because as I said, I was 13, and he knew because he saw the form that I was going to fill out. I stayed in that troop up until I was in World War II. When World War II came, they couldn't find a scoutmaster, and they were going to disband the troop. So I went down, and I, I met with the commission, and he took me down. And they, I guess they had about 20 youngsters. So they were playing basketball and different things, and he introduced me to the, to the boys. And he said, I'm going to leave you now. He said, I know you can handle it. So, I knew I had a problem because they were so used to playing basketball that they weren't getting any scouting. So I called for order and I called the command to fall in. And the fellas were taking their own time because they were testing me. So I said, fall out. 
so they took the wrong time and fall out. So the third time, you could hear me a block away when I give, gave the command. So I told a fellow who was a scribe who looked like a very nice young fellow, I said, open the door, go open the door. This was down at the community center, that's where we met. And I said, now I'm working three shifts. The only reason why I'm taking this troop over is because I was one of the original members of Troop 1. I said, now if you want scouting, I'll give you as much as I know. If you don't want it, get out. The door is open. So not none of them left. I stayed in there until it got maybe a year and a half or two years. I stayed in there until it got a little too much for me. We had what they call a camp or read down to Morton Park, three days. And that's when you went down and did everything you knew about scouting. I won, my troop won the highest of wars and highest points. Hmm. The three days that we were down. The night when I told them that I was going to have to give up the troop, the boy stood there and cried. Hmm. Because see, it was too tough because I was working three shifts hmm. at, at, at the Cool Island, so I had to give it up. That we had a we had a drum corps, and then we had uh, well, we had one of the nicest drum corps in the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. We won quite a few honors. Mm -hmm. So we had a good troop. We had a scoutmaster that had served in the navy, and so he he was very good. When you were growing up, let's say uh, perhaps a little bit later in life, as you were a young adult, uh, Mr. Triplett, <clears throat> perhaps in the 30s, 40s, uh, did you get a flavor of what uh, city politics was like, what was going on in the city politically? No, I never, I never got into politics in, in those days. Well, that's about uh, the end of our interview. I wonder, though, uh, if any memories come to your mind uh, about uh, growing up in your neighborhood. Uh, that you haven't mentioned any stories or any particular things that you can recall about your neighborhood or about your about your growing up uh, during that time in the various areas of the city. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if anything comes up, uh, we'll be having another meeting. Uh -huh. We kind of go over some of the same things, but uh, mostly we'll be looking at events, historical events, you know, looking at, at your life and your neighborhood uh, during the Depression, during the hurricane. Uh, probably talking to you too about the steamship company. Right. Uh, right. The historical side is very interesting, the steamship company too. I think you have any okay. That'll be the next time. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Thanks very much. I hope I was at some help to you. I probably oh, okay. studied these things too much, and sometimes no? it can confuse you. Yeah. You know. That was it. Yes. What can you tell me about your your work with the Fall River Line? Perhaps when you began working there. Okay. Right. Uh, I began working for the Fall River Line in 1937. Uh, before that, I, I would like to say that I was working on the WPA, and one of the fellas said to me one day, he said, how come you're working out here when you could be working for the steamship company? And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, you work for the superintendent of the steamship company, and the man that I was working for, well, I never, I worked for his wife because I used to do, go in and do the floors and wash and wax his car. So I, I asked him why he said that, and he said, well, you work for the superintendent. I said, I don't know what that man does. And he said, well, he's a superintendent in the steamship company. If I were you, I'd ask him for a job. So that Saturday when I went in to do the regular work that I do, I asked her if her husband was a superintendent of the steamship company. And she said, yes, why? And I said, well, I, I was wondering if I could get a job down there because I don't like it on the WPA. 
And she said, well, they're not really hiring now because it's a s slow season. And this was on a Saturday. So she said, well, my husband is down in New York tonight. When he comes home, I'll ask him. So about 10 o'clock that night, uh, she, he called me and he told me to report to the steamship company on Monday. Hmm. And he said, they're not hiring, but I talked to the timekeeper and he said, you go in the gate and there'll be a card in there for you and you punch it in. And then you'll meet a man named Mr. Wheeler who will be your boss. So I, I did what he told me. But as I entered, there were about maybe about 200 men outside and they were all screaming and yelling at me to get in line off. But see, down there when they were hiring whatever boss that you work for, if it was a painter or a carpenter, he'd come out each morning and he'd pick so many men. Because some of the men that were working in the same job that I was going to work in, they were upset because I went and I punched the clock. So then I punched the clock and I met the man who was going to be my boss. And he said to me, he said, you know, I don't like this because I've had these men working for me for 10, 12 years. And just because you got a little pull, he said, you're taking their job. So I said, well, I'm sorry about that. So then I worked there for a while, and then they started to, to hire more men. So one day uh, he said, well, we've got a job for you. And, and so he took me over, and over where the rangers were on the boat, he used to have to go up a stack and clean the grease. So this fellow was hoisting me up in a bolster's chair. As I got halfway up, the rope started tearing on, it was hitting some metal. So I yelled down, I came down, and he brought me down. So then he put a new line on, and that started to ravel again. So I came down, and I said to him, I said, I'm not going up anymore. He said, uh, how many men were outside when you came to work this morning? I said, oh, maybe about 225. He said, well, if you don't want to go back up there, it'll be 226. <laughs> so then I, we found out that there was a sprinkler system in there, and as he hoisted me up, the rope would run up, rub, rub, rub up against it, and it would cut the rope. And that's the reason why that was happening to me. So after he put the third rope on, and then I went up and I used to have to take a pail and a huge putty knife and you used to have to scrape all the grease off. That's because when the boats were running and the stoves were going, mm -hmm. the grease used to collect up there and it would cause a fire if you didn't get it all off. So you really had to scrape right down to the metal. Oh, so it was the cook stoves. It was the cook yeah. stoves. Oh. So after that, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't too bad. But we used to, when the boats came in, we used to go and clean, wash paint, and do things like that, which was a job. It wasn't that the best of job. But when I started, I started down in where the engineers uh, worked, where it was, it was tough. That was what they call the glory hole down and It was right down. You could hear the water hitting up against the side huh. of the... Uh, the hull. So I did that for a while. This was the job that they gave me in the beginning. What did you do down there? I did the same thing, uh, scrubbed the paint down there nice. and all because it was pretty greasy because the men had on the overalls. So after a while, it was tough for a while because I was taking someone else's job. But then uh, we started to get along pretty well. And so one day he said to me, <coughs> he said, my wife was having a bridge on Saturday, and do you know anybody that you could get to go in and do some cooking for her? So I said, well, I can do it. So he said, you can? I said, yes. So I went in and cooked some chicken, made chicken salad, potato salad, and so forth. So after that, I was in with, with the boss. So I was living at that time on Deploy Street. We were living in a furnished house. So we were going to move, 
but I didn't have any credits at all. I had to buy everything new. So I was telling him about it one day. So he said, well, why, why don't you wait and let me have a talk with my wife? He said, because I have a place out in Portsmouth, which is a summer place, and we're doing away with that. And he says, I got some furniture in there. Maybe you could use it. So I said, well, that'd be good. So that day when I got through work, he took me out to this summer place, and it was four rooms of furniture. So he said, well, how would you like to, can you use any of this? I said, yes, I could. I said, but what is it going to cost me? He said, nothing. So he gave me a living room set. He gave me a dining room set. He gave me a stove for the kitchen. The whole works, the four rooms. And he even had a truck to pick it up and deliver it to my house where I was living on Kingston Avenue. Mm. So that was really one of the greatest treats of, of, of my life. Mm -hmm. So then we were all through for the summer. And the next year I went back, I worked about two months. And so one morning I was coming down Long Wharf. I, I met a couple of men leaving the job and I didn't know what was wrong. So then as I went along further and, and I saw where we went, at, and in a time clock, I saw some of the men coming up crying. So I asked one of the men what was wrong, and he just pointed to the sign. So I went, went down a little further, and right outside the gate, there must have been about maybe three or four hundred men outside. And there was a great big, huge sign up there that said, shut down, no further notice. So that meant that everybody was out of a job. So one Sunday, my boss came up to the house. As a matter of fact, he called me before then. He said, did I want to go to work on Sunday? So I said, yes. He said, well, we're going to Fall River. So I said, he said, I'll pick you up at a certain time. So he picked me up, say, around about 8 o'clock in the morning. And three of the other men that worked for the steamship company were in the car. So we went to Fall River. And when we got up to Fall River, there must have been about 400 men outside with picks, pipes, and everything. They were on strike. So they called us strike breaker. So one of the men that was with us, riding with us, he was an elderly man. He said, well, I don't know about you fellas. He said, but I'm not going to stay up here. I'm not going to. Because those men, they were, they were ready to kill you. Deck hands, you name it. So finally, we all decided that we would come back. We weren't going to stay mm -hmm. to Newport. So then I worked for a little while afterwards in the summertime. And my boss called me one morning. I guess it must have been about 4 o'clock in the morning. And he said, uh, come down to, the, to work as soon as you can. So I went down, and the Providence boat had broke a shaft. So then they had to get this boat ready, I think it was the New Bedford, which ran from Oaks Bluff, Woods Hole to Nantucket. So I was working on the boat, and all of a sudden I felt the boat moving, and I ran upstairs on the top deck, and the boat was just passing the torpedo station. So I ran to one of the men, and I said, I got to get off. I said, I live in Newport, and we're going by the torpedo station. He said, you're on here for the day. You're going to be the sandwich man. Because I was always afraid of the water. I said, not me. He said, well, there's no way you can get off here. The, the sandwich man? I was making sandwiches. Oh, I see. It was like a summer excursion. Uh -huh. of, so anyhow, I stayed on there for a while, but I got real sick, real sick. Huh. So that night when the boat docked in Providence, I said I wanted to see the steward. So I went to see the steward, and he said, what can I do for you? I said, I want to get off this boat. I said, because I don't like the water. He said, well, you're on here for the summer. And I said, well, not me. So anyhow, he gave me a dollar and a quarter to go to the bus station to get a boat, bus back to Newport. So he said, well, I don't think you're going to make it. You only got about 10 minutes to make the bus. Well, I, I don't think I ran so fast in all my life. But the thing that was upsetting was it was 4th of July and we had my wife will we would put in money 
for fireworks. And uh, of course, I never got to fire the fireworks because I never get in until 11 o'clock that night. So that was one of the highlights of, of, of the Union Steamship Company. <laughs> How long did you work for it? Well, off and on, I worked about. See, I worked. See, the Steamship Company was like. You worked in the wintertime, and then in June, then they start to lay off because there was nothing to do. So then when I got through at the steamship company, I used to go to work at the casino theater for the summer. And then I used to go back to the steamship company in the fall of the year, and then I worked there until I got laid off. And then that was the end when they went on strike. And and the company folded up, and that was the end of the steamship company. Mm. And I never went back anymore after that. Was it difficult for you and um, a lot of people you knew to get jobs after that, after Pardon? folding? Was it hard for you and maybe a lot of your friends to get jobs after that, after it folded down? It was. A lot of them went back to work on the WPA because jobs were very scarce then. Mm. There was hardly any work around Newport at that time. Now, uh, the, the steamship line, I understand, brought a lot of tourists, I guess, into Newport. A lot of tourists. Okay. You see, a lot of times, as a matter of fact, my wife and I, uh, one time we went up, we took a bus up to Four River, and we came back on the Four River line, because at 9 o'clock, the, the boats used to go to New York. They used to make the trip to New York. And then they used to transport a lot of fish on, on, on the boats and ship them out, a lot of fish. Uh, was, were you much affected by the tourists uh, in Newport at that time that were brought in by the uh, steamship line? No, no, it didn't, seem much it didn't affect me at all. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the Depression, Mr. Kipling. You said you worked for the WPA. <clears throat> I worked on the WPA. That's when I I asked, well, uh, like I said, the, the father told me, why are you working here when you could get a job down the steamship company? So that's when I left the WPA to go to work for the steamship company. But after that, I didn't go back to work on the WPA. I when did you start for them? In the WPA? Mm -hmm. 1937. Mm -hmm. What did you do for, for them? Was it road construction? At the WPA? Uh -huh. We were laying a sewer line. You know, all our, our work was pick and shovel. And sometimes we used to go down maybe 10, 12, 14 feet. See, what they used to have down there was so many feet down, then they had a plank. And if you were down 14 feet, we used to put the dirt on a plank. And then the men that were up top used to take the dirt and scoop it off the plank and throw it on the ground. And then the men on the ground used to take and shovel it in into the trucks. Hmm. See, because in those days they didn't have all the modern equipment. Yeah. And they had to employ so many men that they didn't need it. If they had the modern equipment, there wouldn't have been any, that many jobs. Yeah. That's the reason why they employed, so there was at least 250 men working up every day at that time. Wasn't that dangerous work for you? In the ditch it was. So it wasn't dangerous so much. It was scary because not... They, it never happened on the job that I was working on, but they were working over at Fort Adams one time, and they had a little cave-in, and that's all you thought about all day long, was a cave-in. Mm. But they used to have planks running along the side to keep that, to try to stop the cave-in. Mm. And I can remember we used to have to hit the planks, there was a metal cap on the top of the planks, and they used to hit the planks so that the planks would go down deeper. Mm -hmm. But it was when the when the length, length of the plank was used up, then that's the time when you used to get worried because up at top 
there was no plank because the planks were way down on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you were. Now, lots of times before you went to work, especially in the wintertime, you used to have to shovel the snow out of the ditch, or they used to have pumps and pump the water out before you went to work because they supplied you with, with boots and it wasn't too bad, but it was cold. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how much you were paid at that time? Yes, yes twenty seven sixty eight every two weeks. Twenty-seven dollars? Twenty-seven dollars and sixty-eight cents every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Which wasn't, well, that was, wasn't bad money in them days. Mm -hmm. Because they, you had a chance to go and get different things, like food. They had a station where you could go and get flour, powdered milk, Spam, things like that, but I never went to, I was too proud to go up and get it, so I never went and got it. Hmm. Hmm. What do you recall about the uh, beginning of the Depression? I guess you were in your late teens when the Depression started. Right, well, when I was in my teens, then, like I, I said, that I worked on the ice team for a while. Hauling ice uh, for ice boxes. Right, and then... After that, I went to work for de delicatessen, and I used to work, go to work at six o'clock in the morning, and get through at six o'clock at night, and I got a dollar, dollar a day for that. But I did learn how to make pies and things like that, mm -hmm. which is you know very interesting, which was a great help to me later on in, yeah. in the years. Do you recall much about uh, about the depression at that time, or what the depression meant? For you and your family, and for Newport, it meant that if you ever got on your feet, you would never let it happen again. Because you see, the thing that then was, I never smoked in them days. Matter of fact, I never even drank in those days. You you couldn't afford it, and you just had enough money to buy your food and pay your rent and buy clothes, but you you, know, you, you couldn't waste it mm -hmm. because every every nickel counted. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how the Depression affected uh, your neighborhood or Newport? Did you see some changes well, going on there? No, when I worked on, on, when I lived on Kingston Avenue, a lot of those men worked with me on the WPA. Hmm. And then I think sometimes some of their wives, a few of their wives used to go out and, and cook. So they made a go of it. And then of course when they got a chance to better themselves, why well, they just left the WPA. But I, I remember living next door to two of the elderly men who worked on the WPA. Now, when it was real bad, they used to make the young fellas let the, let the elderly men go down lower to get out of the cold, and then the young fellas had to step on top deck. Several mm -hmm. of the, yeah, I guess they used to put the elderly men down, because I was young then, so I, I was one of those that stand on top and shovel dirt. And it was cold and it was windy. Yeah. And, but you had good clothes and you didn't feel it too much. Yeah. But I, I just didn't like it and I wanted to get up there as soon as I could. Yeah. Did you notice if the depression seemed to have affected some parts of town more than others, some neighborhoods more than others? Well, that I don't know because when I got through work at night, I didn't go anywhere. I stayed in the house and played the radio or something of that sort, but I didn't go out that, that much. But as I say, a lot of people, they had hard times. You knew that from listening to the men talking. But they made a go of it. They, they got by. Mm -hmm. They survived. Mm -hmm. No one really went hungry. As a matter of fact, I think there's more employment today than there was in them days. Because the WPA, they had jobs for the people if they wanted to work. Mm -hmm. I don't remember being in any bread lines or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when Newport began to turn around or come out of the Depression? When that the war started? changed things. The war. That the war started to make jobs for people. They were working over the torpedo station. 
They were working over the Gould Island, and would go over to Torpedo Station to be a laborer or a general helper, and that gave a lot of people at my age a chance to, to go to work. The war did it, really, because that, that's when the change was. When, when, when the war was declared, then there was all sorts of jobs for people. Even women were working during the war. There were women working uh, on torpedoes, on the afterbodies, over to Cool Island, where before they, they didn't have any work. So the war, the war made a big difference. I forgot, were you working over the torpedo station? Or I worked over to Ghoul Island. I worked in the place where they call the racks where they stored the torpedoes. And I used to work with an overhead crane. As a matter of fact, the job that I had, they couldn't keep too many men on that job because the, the torpedoes used to, used to slide in on skids. And you used to have to climb up and grease the skids. And it wasn't a very clean job, but the rating moved fast. And as a matter of fact, I started as a third class laborer. And when I got through before the war ended, uh, I was a first class ordinance man. And, but it was, a, it was a job, and it was better than being outside, it was an inside job. Did any other members of your family work at the uh, Gould Island at that time? No, 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 no because my children were all small, and, that, and none of my, my brother went in the service, so he didn't work, but none of the family worked. Yeah. So your work on Gould Island then was mostly in the, uh, uh, working with the torpedoes? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, the, we used to take care of the British, uh, we used to take care of their torpedoes, and then they used to storm in our racks. But after, later on, they built a little shed for the British people, so then they took care of their own torpedoes. They didn't have to take care of them anymore. How long did you work at the torpedo station? I worked there about two and a half years. You see, I was a war service appointee, which I knew that when I took the job. So when the war was over, I was one of the first ones to get the notice. To be fired. To, to be, be laid off. Yeah. To be laid off. Yeah, so that's, after I left that job, then that's when I started doing house cleaning. I can remember one morning when I got through, I went to pick up the paper and I saw this lady that I used to know, and she asked me, was I on vacation? And I said, I'm on a long vacation, I got laid off. So she said, well, would you want to do some work for me in the house? I said, gladly. She said, when can you start? And I said, I can start now. And I had forgot that I went to get the paper. My wife didn't know where I was at. So then I worked with her for about a week, cleaned the whole house. So she was talking to this lady and she said, oh, my house is all clean for the summer. She said, how did you get that done? She said, well, I have Ernest and he's cleaned my house for me. So she said, well, I'd like to have that done to my house. Can I talk to him on the telephone? So I talked to her on the telephone and she said, well, when can you start? And I said, well, I'll start Monday. So I worked one week with her and then someone else had me do their cleaning. And so finally I had been to five different houses. <clears throat> so then they got together and they said, why don't you come in one day a week and clean our house for us? So they decided which one wanted me on a Monday, which one wanted me on a Tuesday. And I did that for oh, maybe a year. So finally I was getting a little tired of that and I heard that there was going to be an opening in Rogers High School. So I went up and I applied for the job. And I didn't get it right away, but after three different times I tried, I finally got the job because there was fellas that were ahead of me that had real pull. So finally I, I got the job and I went to 
see the superintendent, and he said the job consisted of part-time custodian and part-time uh, take care of the athletic equipment. Now he said this is going to be a tough job, you're going to be dealing with youngsters, and I don't know if you will like it or not. I said I'll try it. So that was in 1951 that I went to Rogers High School, and I had charge of the freshmen, sophomores, all the equipment, football equipment. We had about 125 kids out for football, and especially spring football, mm -hmm. and I used to have to clean all the football shoes, mud and everything, clean them all. So finally, we had a change of coaches, and we had a new coach, and he said to me, asked me what I did, and I told him. So he saw the fellas bringing the shoes in from on top of the window from spring practice, and I had to clean them. So he said, you're not going to do that anymore. He said, you could, all you can do is take care of the equipment. Because you see, when the equipment went away to be reconditioned, all the equipment had to be numbered when we started this football season. So he said, from now on, each player is going to take his own shoes home and clean them. It'll give you more time to take care of the other work. Mm -hmm. So I did. That was really a great relief for me because sometimes it was so bad I used to bring the shoes home at night and clean them. 125 off of football. It, it, it was tough, especially in, in spring uh, training. There was snow on the ground. There was mud. Kids would bring the shoes in, had to clean them. So you worked for the school department for many years, didn't you? I worked for the school department from 1951 to 19. 27 years. I worked for, for the school department for 27 years. And I retired in 1979. Yeah, you started in 51. Yeah. Started in 51. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back just a moment to World War II era, uh, did you notice uh, Newport seemed to change or be influenced by uh, the changes in World War II and the Navy coming in? Did you see a lot of changes in Newport from 40 to 45? As far as the business, like this to say. Well, see, with the Navy being in Newport, uh, that made a lot of money flowing, mm -hmm. which was a great help to the city. Mm -hmm. Because I used to, as I said, I used to once in a while go and tend bar for some of the offices at that time. Mm -hmm. So that made that made a lot of work for the, for the people in Newport. Mm -hmm. It also helped you, I guess. It oh yeah, you saw more yes, money come in yourself, did, right? I did. Uh, were you or any members of your family at that time active in volunteer work uh, for the war effort and such? No, because, see, my sisters and all, they worked, two of them worked in private family, and then my sister, one of my other sisters was going to school, but both were going to school, so they didn't get a chance of doing that type of work at all. Yes, Lord. You did, uh, I forgot what you called it. You know, when they had air raid warden, they had air raid warden. You were an air raid warden? I was an air raid warden all during the war. I see. As a matter of fact, one night I was out, and you're supposed to, I forget what you call it, but they used to put out fires with them. There was a name for it. It was a tank, and it was. So I didn't take it with me, and this was to put out the bombs, they dropped the bombs, uh -huh. put, the, put out the bombs. Uh -huh. So a fellow was a fireman, and he came around and he said, uh, it was like a pump. Uh -huh. He said, where's your pump tonight? And I said, well, I don't think I need it, I haven't used it yet. So he said, well, you never know if you're going to have to use it. So then when I went in the house, it was like on Warner Street, I looked and I saw this 
fire. He had set off a bomb so that I could go back in the house and get my pump. <laughs> and he was laughing. He said, from now on you carry it with, with you all the time. So I figured, well, I hadn't used it. It wasn't necessary, so I didn't even fill it. And I had to go fill it and go out and put the fire on. <laughs> so that was, I, yeah, I was an air raid warden. Was this for your neighborhood? Like each neighborhood would each have an air raid warden? Each neighborhood had an air raid warden. And you'd have certain hours you'd have to walk beat or what? No, no. Well, I was, after that, I was with the auxiliary police. And I, I had did police duty, and I was stationed around Harrison Avenue. And when you went to work at night, you didn't know where they were going to send you. They might send you down by the pond. They might send you on Broadway. And this you did two hours work each. Volunteer police. Was this part of the war effort, too? This is part of the war effort. Because a lot of the men were gone. That's right. So a lot of men were gone. So but as air raid warden, uh, would you walk around the neighborhood at certain times of the night? Or? Only, yes, I did, but then afterwards I was transferred to the auxiliary police, ah. and then I, I, went, I went wherever they sent me. Yeah. I liked that better anyhow because it was interesting and it gave you a little authority too, <laughs> you know, because you had a badge and you had a yeah. club. Not that you used it, but it was just the idea of being, doing something different. What kind of security measures were used then? Do you remember blackout curtains or any other types of they security measures? They had special shades that you had to make. And they sold the cloth, and they used to cover the windows with the cloth. In other words, on our curtains, I took and tacked them on so that when you roll up the curtain or pull it down, the black cloth was on there. Yes. And when you heard the air raid signal that everybody was supposed to put their lights out. Now when we were on duty, if we saw a light coming through the window, then we used to knock on the doors and tell the people. Sometimes the people didn't want to do it, they mm -hmm. said, you know, but after a while you, you, you talk to them and they did it. Mm -hmm. But you could be maybe a hundred feet away and you could see where some of the light was coming through. Was in charge of evacuation buses. Uh, in case of a bombing, the children right. would be evacuated. I see. So we both were pretty active because your mother took care of the children, then didn't she? Yeah. Do you remember uh, where you were or what you were doing when uh, you first got word of World War II beginning? When World, World War II began, mm -hmm. I had a butler's job. And I remember it was on a Sunday morning, and I was sitting down reading the Sunday papers, and my boss was in the bedroom talking to his wife, and I heard it on the news. So I went and I said, man, his name was Mr. Burns, and I said, Mr. Burns, I said, I don't want you to think I'm crazy, but I just heard over the radio that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Would, would that be true? So he ran in the room and he turned on his radio, and sure enough, it was, it was, it was true. But at first I thought he'd think I was crazy. <laughs> well, no one expected anything like that. Mm. But it was on a Sunday morning, I never forget it. The hurricane of 38, what do you recall about the hurricane? The same estate that I was working at, my sister and I, the people that I was working for, they used to go away all the time. And they were in, I think they were in Bermuda at the time. And there were some carpenters working at the house. As a matter of fact, one of the fellows that was working there was a fellow that, that spoke to me about the same project. And the wind came up, and as I say, nobody knew it was a hurricane. And the wind started blowing and furniture was flying around. And then the men that were working there, the carpenters, they left around about quarter four. They said, we're going back to the shop. So then when they got out started, they said, we don't think we're going to make it back to the shop. This is really bad. And then they still didn't know it was a hurricane. So they left. 
and about an hour after that, we lost, we lost our telephone. So then, after we lost our telephone, we lost our electricity. So then we really started to get scared, and we had a dog that we used to have to take care of, a Scotty dog. So the dog wanted to go out, and I said, of all the times, this dog wants to go out, and I had to let him out, but I put him on a leash, and he pulled away from me, just lost control of the leash, so I had to chase him. That's when the estate was it's on the corner of Rhode Island Avenue and Old Beach Road. We lost 14 trees right, that day. Right there. As a matter of fact, one of the trees that fell down, we he made a room upstairs panel out of black walnut, and he had a desk made out of that tree. It was a huge tree. We lost 14 trees that day. So then. <laughs> When I came home, my wife was very upset with me because this is around about 8 o'clock. Wires were all down and everything, and I had a flashlight. And when I got home, she was really upset because I hadn't called her, but I couldn't call her because it was after she realized what had happened. But I couldn't call her, and I couldn't, we were scared to leave because the way the wind was blowing, and, and uh, we could hear, we were right down near the water, and you could hear the waves down at the beach, because Rhode Island Avenue is not too far from the beach, it's a matter of five minute walking distance. So we really were scared, and we, we couldn't talk to anyone at afterwards because the phones were down, so we just had to stay there and, and wait. So finally, just before it got too dark, we stumbled over, telegraph poles were down, and we went out the back way, and trees were down. It was, it was something that you, you couldn't believe, it was, yet it was something that was scary. Mm -hmm. I think it took me a good 45 minutes, 50 minutes, to get home from Rhode Island Avenue. Mm -hmm. So then that's when we, actually, with my wife and I, we went out and took the flashlights and walked around to see the damage that had been done, and yet we couldn't believe it. What happened? What what was uh, life like for the next few days after the hurricane? Pardon? What was life like uh, for the next few days? It after was the dead. Hurricane? It was quiet, and everybody, a lot of the people were down around the avenue and, and, and Bellevue Avenue and Spring Street. A lot of the people had trees in their yard, and they were cutting trees, and they'd give you a job sawing if you could, if you wanted to saw. Now that made a lot of work because a lot of trees were down, men were around cutting wood, trees. Mm -hmm. Was your house damaged? Uh, no, my house wasn't, and, and that, that structure, that house was really good. But at the estate, we had like a, the top, like a little porch up top tree fell across that. And just across the street from us, the tree was right in the middle of the road. The big maple tree was right in the middle of the road, which was a house belonged to Mrs. Mordow Elliott. I don't know if you've heard that name since you've been here. And the tree was across the road. So it really was dangerous because if we had a couple of good fires, Newport would have really been in trouble because the apparatus wouldn't have been able to get through. Well, see, every corner on Rhode Island Avenue that you went to, trees were down. What's what, What's the most uh, remarkable story that you can recall that came out of the Hurricane of 38? Uh, I don't really know, really, except that we had a dinner party one night and how we got the dinner was we cooked it in the fireplace and we had four guests for dinner. And the whole t now on Rhode Island Avenue the electricity was out for over a week. But on where I live, the electricity was off for only about three days, I think. Hmm. But we did all the cooking in the fireplace. Hmm. That's where 
the training of the Boy Scouts came in, mm -hmm. which was very handy. You hear some guests of people, these people who had been, uh, they had to evacuate their house or they had to leave their house? The people that I worked for? No, no, no. We used to have just guests in for dinner oh. because a lot of people didn't have any electricity to have anything because we didn't either, but we used, we had a lot of candles oh. and lamps, you know, like, like we have here. Did the hurricane seem to change uh, your neighborhood or Newport uh, permanently? Well, no, not that I know of, really. It's just that people just couldn't get over it that when it happened. Mm -hmm. but it's like out in the country, out in Middletown, it was unbelievable the, the damage that was done mm -hmm. to the houses out there, some of the houses. Trees fell right through the middle of the house, crushed right through the house. Okay, uh, the jazz era, the jazz festivals in Newport, Mr. Uh, uh, did you ever attend many of the uh, jazz festivals? Or? I think we went, when it first started, we went to Freebody Park, and I don't know if it was Count Basic, it was one of the authors that were playing up there, but we didn't stay because the mosquitoes were so bad. Is that right? And we, and we left. But then, during one of the festivals at Freebody Park, I was working down on Aquinnick Avenue, and that's when they had the riot. And I had a dinner party that night. So my wife called me up and she said, you better get home because there's a riot at Freebody Park. So I went and I told, I was telling this man because he was outside smoking, and I said, I'm going to get out of here because there was a riot at Freebody Park and I'm going to get home. And so he said, oh my God, he says, my daughter is up there. So then one of the other guests, she had a daughter up there also. So they left, the two men left. And the lady was that I was working for, she got very upset, she said, because I broke up her party. So I took all the, well, we were all through serving anyhow. We were just hanging around serving drinks. So we took all the dirty dishes and we left them downstairs and we headed for home. Well you know as you go to Second Beach we were going that way because the mob was coming down oh maybe 10 or 15 abreast and the police was chasing them to Middletown so that they could get out on the main road, get out of Newport. So as I got to Quinnick Avenue, I turned, and the state police, I was going to turn left. You know where the Taylor Rental place is? Mm -hmm. And well, we got that far, and we were going to turn left. And the state trooper said, you go that way. I said, I don't live that way. I live in Newport. And he had one of these, well, there was about four of them. They had, and you could see there were, there was a lot of tension. And he banged on my beach wagon and he said, you go that way. So we finally, we went that way and all the people were in back of us. Once in a while they'd sit on the hood of my car, scared me to death. These were the people that were running. Hmm. So finally we went down the road, oh, maybe about six miles. So we turned around and I gave it the gun. And I was going about 40 miles an hour, 50 miles, coming back to Newport, mm -hmm. and they didn't stop me. So that's how I got out of that, mm -hmm. that mess. But, I'm sorry, go ahead. but they put the fire hose on the people and everything. They call in the Marines from over the base. They call in National Guard. And it was really something. What year was that? About what year? Do you remember what year that was already? Uh, no, no, I'm talking about the Jazz Festival. Oh, the, the riot, the big riot. The first time they had, the first year, I forgot what year it was. I think it was the first, but I don't know the first or second one. I would have looked that up, I didn't know. No, he was just up there. He wasn't working, so it was the first. No, he 
What caused the riot? Do you, do you know? It was tickets. They oversold, and the people or that had tickets couldn't get in, and they had sold it. Too many tickets, and, and that's what caused it. Mm -hmm. So they were going to really tear up the place. Mm -hmm. But they uh, they used tear gas. They used everything on the people during that festival. Anybody that you knew that got hurt? Or? No, no. I don't think anyone really got the tear gas. Probably two. I don't know who they were, but a, a few people got a dose of the tear gas. But they were chasing them both ways. They were chasing them up Memorial Boulevard to Bellevue Avenue, heading them toward uh, Turo Street. That's where they were. But I was in it on the Quinnick Avenue. It was the only way I could go because I couldn't come up Memorial Boulevard because, like I say, there were 10, 12 abreast, and these were thousands of people. There were thousands of people. Do you think that the festivals uh, should have been continued in, in 72? Well, I don't know. Uh, they just, they had a meeting with the city officials and they decided the best thing to do was not to have it. That's when a, a wealthy lady was in, was running, I forget her name now. But, who? Mrs. Laurel. Laurel. And she, uh, they think they lost everything on that festival. Hmm. How do you think that the city handled the disturbances? Well, I think they handled it very well because they had the police and they had the state police and they had the Marines from over the training station. Uh -huh. And I think that it was a godsend that they did have them. They had a that night because if they hadn't, the our police force was too small to handle that and it probably would have been somebody that really got hurt. The departure of the Navy fleet in 72, 73. Do you feel that the uh, the Navy's leaving uh, Newport in the early 70s, was that a loss for Newport overall? It was a big loss for the people in the city of Newport. In what ways do you feel? Well, jobs. A lot of people worked in private family for the Navy, and they lost their jobs. But I was, it, it didn't affect me because I was working for the, for the school, and so I had a job. Which was fortunate. Did you see that most all of Newport, though, was pretty well affected by the Navy pullout? Oh, yes. Pretty equally? Were there it some was. areas that seemed to be hit worse, hit harder? Well, the ones that were hit worse were the bars. <laughs> <laughs> they just completely closed up because that's the way they made their living. Mm -hmm. Did you know very many people who lost uh, Navy related jobs? No. Not that I, maybe a few members, maybe of my church that used to work for the Navy lost jobs. Did the Navy pullout seem to affect your neighborhood very much at that time? No, no, because there was nobody in the service that lived on my, my street. Mm -hmm. were, you know, also being an elderly people. Yeah. And not many of them seemed to work for the Navy. No, mm -hmm. no. Did the Navy pullout affect? To you in any way? You said it didn't affect you job-wise because you're working for the city schools. No, it, it, because I just used to once in a while go around and ten bar for a cocktail party or something like that, but it, it, it didn't affect me too much at all. You still had plenty of catering business also. Well, yes, but that. still, still I had a school. Yeah. You know, that was a main, my mainstay. Could you describe a Friday or Saturday night on Dame Street when the fleet was in? <laughs> well, I didn't go down Dame Street too often because, as you know, that every so, so many feet they had bars and the sales were in, in the bars. So you actually, unless you had something, not that you were afraid of anything, but actually if you didn't have anything 
to do it on Thames Street, which we call Thames Street, he just didn't go down there at all. Mm -hmm. Because the minute they came over, got off the ship, they were down the bars. Of course, a lot of the servicemen also used to leave and go to Fall River. A lot of them used to go to Fall River in them days. Yeah. All the servicemen that were in Newport didn't stay in Newport. They went to Fall River. To the bars? Or? Well, I don't know, but they, mm -hmm. they cut it. They left town. <laughs> what they did in Fall River, I don't know, but you used to see a lot of the buses we, were loaded from mm -hmm. those times. Uh, the ferry, the ferries before the bridge. Uh, did you ride the ferry very much? Well, when when we used to go over to all my children who were in URI, we used to take the ferry and, and ride the ferry. As a matter of fact, we had one party one night. That was the last night that the ferry was going to run. And the man that I was working for, I told him, I said, uh, we got about 15 minutes to make that ferry, and we're not going to make it. And so he said, don't worry about it. And I said, well, I am. I said, how am I going to get home? Well, I didn't know he was like a commissioner. And so he called up. We finally got, got out of there. And he called up and told him to hold the ferry. And he said, well, if you miss the ferry, we can open up the bridge for you anyhow. Because the next day the bridge was going to be open. So he called up down the ferry and told him to hold the ferry. And he told me the blue beach wagon was going to come down and take the ferry. They wouldn't take let no more cars on. And we were on the tail end of the ferry. And all the people were wondering, who's coming? Who are they holding the ferry up for? And who came on the ferry? My wife and I and a couple of us. And that was the last trip that we took on the ferry. Yeah. That's, that's, I'll never forget that moment. Oh, yeah. You always used to take the, yeah. take the ferry the part off and just kind of stay as on. A pleasure ride. Or or stay pleasure. on it. Stay on the ferry. And yeah, we'll go back and go forth. Go back and forth. Jamestown to here. Right. They never bothered you. Yeah, huh. they just, yeah. When they were smaller. Uh -huh. Do you remember yeah. the names of some of the ferries? Sure. The, uh, the Governor Car and the one was called the Jamestown Ferry. I'll show you some. And the governor called the Jamestown Ferry, and I think there was another one. And I'll show you a picture of one before you. Okay. What do you remember about the rides on the ferry? What was it like? Well, it was exciting, you know, and it was a beautiful view because the boat used to go by Rose Island, which you hear so much about now. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful then. It was kept up, and you used to go by, ride by, and you see. You could always tell when you were going to come into Rose Island because they had these white bricks and it was written out, Rose Island. Hmm. And that, that was a very, very pretty sight. Sometimes it was a little rough, even just for that little run from the Port to James Island. Hmm. You didn't like the water very much. Wasn't Never it, liked the water. Wasn't it kind of uncomfortable for you to take the ferry? Well, it wasn't the ferry. My wife didn't like the ferry, but I didn't mind just that little distance. Oh, I see. But to go from here to New York, <laughs> I didn't like it. <coughs> I didn't like it <coughs> at all. Was there some, do you remember some problems about the ferry system? Was there any difficulty or with the ferries? It was difficult. And for instance, if you were on this side or even either side, lots of times the ferry could only take so many. So then you had to wait over until the next ferry. Sometimes it was so such a large crowd you were lucky to make the second ferry. Yeah. Because see they, they only took so many cars. Especially around the holidays, people were coming to Newport mm -hmm. and that's what made the traffic so bad. Mm. They had long waits for the ferry. Oh long waits yeah. sometimes. How did you feel about the building of the bridge, Newport Jamestown? Well, I, I was glad to see it because, although my father always told me that they were going to build a bridge someday, but he never lived 
to see it go. But it was a lot easier than waiting for the ferry. You just, you just went. You didn't have to worry about missing the ferry or, or catching the last ferry at 11 o'clock. When they built the bridge, that was a godsend. Do you kind of miss the ferry in any way? No, when we were younger, we liked the ferry. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I really don't miss it. It, it was nice for, for tourists to ride over mm -hmm. on the ferry. The restoration and rebuilding that's been going on in Newport the last uh, 10, 12 years or so. Uh, what what are some of your feelings about uh, the rebuilding that you've seen going on with the uh, the old sections of town? Well, one thing that I don't like to say, but there's nothing I can do about it, is when we were kids, we used to go down on Thames Street, and you could go down any dock and see the water, or maybe go down there and fish. But today, they've closed it off so that you you can't even see the water at all. And that's the only thing that I have against all that building on the waterfront. It's, mm -hmm. it's taking away the beauty of the, of the waterfront because I'm just one person. You know. and I've heard that said by a lot of people. What about some of the uh, neighborhoods, the old buildings that they've rebuilt? Uh, how do you feel about the, uh, well, like the rehabbing at uh, the point in the point area in the historical hill district? Do you have any feelings about seeing those places rebuilt? Well, yes, it's, it's a nice a nice change, except that what hurts me is, because uh, I didn't have the money, but a lot of those places I could have, could have probably bought for a song and dance, because like I used to know some of the people that I worked for when I was going around cleaning. As a matter of fact, one lady owned an awful lot of property, and there was a house on 3rd Street, I think it was, that her father owned. And she said, I'll sell it to you for $4,000. Well, that was a lot of money to me then, but then today, that house over there is worth around $60,000. So there's the difference. I had a lot of opportunities like that for working for people, but I didn't have the money to do it with. Did you know any of the people who worked on the restoration? in rebuilding some of the, those areas in the point of historical industry. No. Sometimes people who were displaced or moved out to uh, when those neighborhoods were, were rebuilt. Did you know anybody who uh, was displaced? Well, some of the people who I think have died since they, you know, that lived in some of those houses. And then some of them moved out and they lived in different neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, I think, well, of course, all the neighborhoods, I think, were good neighborhoods. But quite a few of the people have moved out and bought homes in Middletown and Portsmouth. You know, they, they bettered themselves, a lot of them, because they were paying rent in them days anyhow. Most everybody was slaughtered. There was only a few people that owned houses over there, and of course there were some people that owned a house over there that we knew that belonged to our church, but they died, and since then they fixed the house over. As a matter of fact, I was checking with a fellow not too long ago, and he said the house, went for, after they fixed it, went for $70,000. That's over the point, that's where there's a liquor store on one corner, this house is fixed up on the other corner. Uh, yeah, I think you said the house that you lived in, uh, you were born in and raised in uh, up until your teens or so, that was on what street? Pond Avenue. Pond Avenue. You yeah. said that house is still there? That house is still there, and, uh, and my sister lived in it for years, and then they sold it, and now a fellow has fixed that house up, and it's unbelievable how he has spent the money. Well, it's been one of the houses that was rehabbed in that neighborhood. Well, that, the house that I lived in, the house that I was born in, was well constructed, mm -hmm. and it was a it was a nice house. It had a beautiful yard, 
As a matter of fact, they had a well in that yard, and of course, years ago when so many people were sick, they just made all the people fill in their wells in Newport. No one was allowed to have a well. They made them fill them in. But even the house that I was born in, as, it was, as I say, was well constructed. It was a nice, it was a real nice house. There was eight rooms in that house. And this, you see, a lot of these fellows that bought these houses, they gift a lot of them carpenters. And the fellow that fixed that house up where I live, he was a carpenter. And I think he's living in one part and he's rented the other part out. Hmm. What's the address? 14 Fine Avenue. 14 Fine Avenue. Yeah. So you've seen that neighborhood, that part of town change? Oh yeah, well, see, now on the right hand side of Pine Avenue, there were always the houses there. But then on the left hand side of Pine Avenue, from one end to the other, except on one corner there was maybe three or four houses. Uh, now that's all like a, a home for the aged, the elderly people. Oh, yes. That's, yeah. that's been built up. But though years, years ago they were called the blocks, and yet, yet people lived in there, and they were good people. And they had four rooms, but the only thing is that they had no running, they had no baths there, they had outside what they call outhouses in them days. Which houses? The ones they all along that whole side where they built up. Ah, they tore those down. To they build tore those the down, right? Oh, I see. And one man, I think it was well, two men, owned those that whole block area. Hmm. But they were real good people in those blocks some years ago. They were good people. But the houses just weren't very. They weren't very. Uh, they didn't have very many uh, substantial stuff. Plumbing. No. 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 The America's Cup series, the uh, racing. Uh, were you ever involved very much with the America's Cup scene? No, not the America's Cup. I had sometimes several people came to see me and wanted me to fix food for the America's Cup. Some of the big companies, but if they told me what they wanted, and then when it come time to tell them what I wanted. I didn't get the job because I wanted a certain amount of money before and the balance of the day of the affair, but a lot of them said, well, they didn't do business that way, and I didn't take it because I know that lots of times people got stuck for some of them. After they left Newport, you didn't see them anymore, and I knew that, so I didn't want because I know a lot of business places they went on people money, so I didn't need it. Because I say I had a steady job anyhow, but it was, it was a chance to make a few bucks on the side. I was glad to do it, mm. but then I, I wasn't about to get stuck for something I couldn't afford. Mm. So, well, overall, do you feel that the America's Cup uh, races uh, had been good for Newport? Or I think it was good? very good for Newport, and it's, it's going to be missed a great deal because it brought a lot of people in, in this town. These people spent a lot of money. Mm -hmm. but I think it's a sad, it was a sad thing for the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say there was uh, any uh, negative effect uh, of the cup being here? Were there any uh, bad side effects to the America's Cup when it was here? I don't think so. I think they did, they were just out sailed us. <laughs> I, I have my hopes, but I mean, a lot of people have their hopes, but I don't feel that we'll ever get that back again. <laughs> I don't think we will. It'll probably take a while, for sure. I probably won't see yeah. it. <laughs> it won't, won't be in my time. Well. Thanks very much, Mr. Tracy. Is there anything else that you can think of that we haven't covered that, uh, that you'd like to recall? Grace, anything I forgot? I don't know. You've been with me all these years. I don't know anything I don't know yesterday. <laughs> You've got a lot of good recollections.
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'm getting a little older too, you know, and you kind of forget. I try to try to remember these things. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I lost it, but I had a record. Of, uh, at first, this was what I made out when I went to work for the government. But I had a record of the right up until now, well, until I went to work for the, the private family. But I lost it. I, I tore this house apart trying to find it. And I'll bet you a couple of days or next week sometime <laughs> I'll, I'll come across it. As a matter of fact, there was a letter in it. I had letters from, like, Miss Helen Arthur was the manager of the casino theater. She worried a lot about me. She was a nice lady of having a job for the winter. And she wrote a letter to the Viking Hotel, and she wrote a letter to the manager of the Mujinga King Hotel, because she was worried about me having a job until I came back for the next season, if I came back. And uh, let's see, it was, it was kind of hard, because everybody was working, they didn't need too many people. But she was looking for me to get a steady job, and no way could you get in a hotel in them days to get a steady job. Because the people that had those jobs, they didn't leave them. Especially when you got three meals a day, mm -hmm. who was going to leave a job like that? <laughs> what did you do for the casino theater? Well, the casino theater, I was the janitor there. 